Hello and welcome you all to this afternoon session of 7th CCMB Founders Day, which includes alumni talk as well as uh, guest lecture by our honorable chief guest. I hope you all have saved some food for thoughts as we have lot to chew on in this session. Moving ahead. Yeah. So uh, we'll begin with the alumni talks. Uh, first talk is by Dr. Kasturi Mitra. Uh, Dr. Kasturi Mitra uh, completed her master's degree uh, from Calcutta University. And she moved to CCMB in 2000 uh, for her PhD under Dr. Uh, Shivaji. And uh, she moved for a postdoc uh, to NIH US, uh, where uh, and currently now she is an assistant professor of biology at Ashoka University. Uh, she is also a DBT Welcome Trust Senior Fellow and an adjunct uh, faculty, Genetics Department, University of Alabama at Birmingham. Her lab focuses on structure function relationship of mitochondria in health and diseases. Her lab's website says that they walk, talk and dream mitochondria. On that note, I would like to call Dr. Kasturi uh, to enlighten us with the mitochondrial dream. I'm Kasuri. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, a lot of you uh, I know already, uh, and a lot of you are new. Uh, and as, as as was introduced, I joined in 2000 and, uh, and left CCM in 2005 uh, to do my postdoc. And uh, what I'm going to do today. Um, is uh, talk about my journey, not so much about delivering s what we have discovered in science in detail, but then uh, that will come as I talk about my journey uh, from CCMB onwards. And I'd like to keep it uh, like a story for the reason that I became a scientist in CCMB. I had no scientific spirit even when I was doing my masters. I wanted to do other things in life. Uh, and I got into uh, doing science because of a push from my dad and uh, I never uh, regretted it after when I left CCMB or rather I, when I was discovering the spirit of science at CCMB the way CCMB you know uh, trains uh, graduate students uh, I fell in love with it and and now I'm an avid scientist who can never think of doing anything else even not even industry I'm such an avid basic scientist who also has moved into translational effort a little bit in an integrated manner uh, since it's, uh, it's uh, PMB's birthday, um, I thought that uh, I should uh, let you guys know as a part of my experience with PMB, which was very little, uh, because Lalji was the director when uh, uh, we joined. Uh, the, the way I remember PNB is, is, uh, is that he's the guy, he's the great guy, who actually introduced me, not me, in a talk, uh, actually to the audience where I was there, the golden ratio and Fibonacci number, okay? So uh, this is a, a, a mathematics principle that is behind the beauty of our world. And since I'm an artist at heart, uh, which, you know, that's what I wanted to do in life, be an artist, uh, so this really appealed to me. And that's how I remember PNB, okay? So please look up, we won't go into golden ratio and Fibonacci's number, but then everything that is beautiful can be explained by uh, the golden ratio and Fibonacci's number, and, th and that's real math, okay? So uh, PNB believed in marriage of arts and science. That was a very appealing concept for me, uh, and that's how I remember him. Uh, so uh, this was, so this is, uh, th this is maybe third or fourth time I'm, I'm revealing that I was not a scientist before I came to CCMB uh, and first time I revealed that was actually in an interview uh, that uh, uh, my funding agency took because they liked uh, what we discovered uh, through their uh, uh, through their money and uh, there was this thing called an artist at heart and and mentioning I when I was interviewed I told them the story and my, my dad pushed me and then uh, I had no uh, scientific spirit and this this is what I had shared with them my PhD was eye-opening that's was uh, that was when I really felt the thrill of science and ever since it has been a real passion for me I went back and thanked my dad I told him you knew me the best and and here I just want to uh, acknowledge and announce that CCMB is the place where I became a scientist. Uh, I had no inclination, zero inclination. 
And of course, I keep up my artistic work. Uh, my salvation is with music. Uh, the reason I, uh, I titled my talk as Follow the White Rabbit is because that's what CCMB taught me uh, as an individual budding scientist that wherever there is excitement, follow it. And I, I'm sure all of you know what this phrase means. Um, so just some, uh, some uh, memories from CCMB. This is my dad, who knew me the best. This is in CCMB, uh, uh, not hostel at that time. We were uh, still at the, at the uh, flat, uh, at the fac whatever flat that was. Then we moved to the hostel. This is me in Shivaji's lab, uh, uh, the CASA uh, computer-assisted sperm uh, analyzer that I was working on. And this is in the center court on Hindi day. We were actually uh, staging this skit. Uh, and of course, these are all uh, uh, batchmates and some are seniors. Shubodip was the star of that event, okay? Uh, he, 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 he dressed up as a beggar. Uh, and yeah, it, it was, I don't know if you guys still hold uh, Hindi day and do fun activities like that. And uh, like, I got to do everything in CCMB and even actually sing. Uh, uh, I think it was here where uh, we, uh, uh, Suresh organized a, a, a cultural program and I could actually uh, uh, keep up my um, interest in, in art as well. Talking about mentors, um, Shivaji was my mentor, uh, of course, official mentor. And the freedom that he gave me to actually follow the rabbit, follow the white rabbit, was amazing. And I would never uh, regret uh, joining Shivaji's lab because I used that freedom even in my postdoc, uh, postdoctoral mentor, mentor's lab where she was exactly like Shivaji. Uh, that's why I joined her lab. And uh, I, the reason I joined Shivaji's lab was because you know he's the one who gives freedom. That's what my seniors told. Uh, so Kamishwari and Archana, they were pillars of Shivaji's lab. I learned a great deal from them. Uh, Jyotsna was my unofficial mentor. Um, I actually approached Jyotsna uh, to get into the cell biology uh, uh, interest group. And I was an orphan there because Shivaji was not part of it. And Jyotsna not only mentored me, not only allowed me uh, to join the cell biology group and even present there, but she's been my mentor uh, since then. Shashi, of course, our was our student coordinator, and Shashi still mentors me. So there's there's no uh, uh, no no uh, discussing that. And Ghansham, a special thing I should mention about Ghansham, I did lab rotation in Ghansham's lab, and in Ghansham's lab, I actually learned how to do critical thinking not in Shivaji's lab, which I joined after doing lab rotation. And I went back, I, I submitted uh, maybe three, four months uh, before my fellowship got over and I still had some uh, money left, like my fellowship left. I approached Ghansham if I can join his lab to learn some more critical thinking. And because I was changing field uh, and Ghansham was doing those kind of work, uh, so, so Ghansham allowed me and I learned more of uh, criti critical thinking in Ghansham's lab. Uh, so uh, in PhD, what uh, I did was in, in CCMB uh, identified identified a, a mitochondrial metabolic enzyme, uh, the function of it in, in sperm. Uh, this is that metabolic enzyme. It, so this is E3, a metabolic enzyme. Uh, you don't need to know anything more than that, uh, other than that E2, E3, E1, they form a complex. And uh, I was doing biochemistry, uh, you know, forward uh, reaction and reverse reaction of the enzyme. But when I generated an antibody and stained uh, the, the, uh, the, the diploid cells, sperm is a haploid cell, stained the diploid cells of the body, that nicely went to the mitochondria, right? Uh, and, oops. Uh, and then this is mitochondria, uh, like the metabolic pathway of mitochondria. And then this, this is very appealing. Uh, of course, it, this, this map was not there at that time. But we all knew that mitochondria formed the intermediary seat of metabolism. And uh, my previous data in the lab sh had interesting, uh, uh, interesting results uh, that metabolic activity is involved for sperm motility. Mitochondria is the energy producer and all that. So I followed it up. And if we stained with the antibody that I raised, if we stained the sperm, it did not go to the mitochondria, which is here, which is here, the red is mitochondria, but it went to the sperm-specific organelles called acrosome and to the tail of sperm where maximum energy is required for sperm movement. Um, so I got really, really interested in mitochondria at that time. And uh, later, actually from Utpal Banerjee's lab, later meaning way later from Utpal Banerjee's lab, it was shown, they cited this paper, and then it showed that not only that particular enzyme, which is called pyruvate dehydrogenase, but there are many other mitochondrial enzymes that actually reside in extra mitochondrial space, uh, nucleus being the one that they were talking about. Uh, this was a cell paper uh, uh, in their work, uh, and it was, uh, uh, it was on, uh, on stem cell. Uh, 
that mitochondrial proteins go elsewhere um, uh, and do their function, local function. So I really, really got interested in mitochondria and then looked up the literature and then found that mitochondria change their shape and there are proteins that you can, that, that you can, that, that were identified which you can, which you knock out, the mitochondria change shape from this to that, okay? So there are proteins that maintain mitochondria shape and this was, I got involved uh, or rather got exposed to that literature because uh, genetic studies had shown uh, sperm mitochondria being altered uh, when you, when you uh, uh, introduce knockout of those proteins and I was working in sperm. So basically I got introduced in the field, into the field of mitochondria fission and fusion, okay? So mitochondria fission and fusion genes change mitochondria shape. And not, not much was known about how the shape change uh, impacts mitochondrial function at that time. Now we know uh, a great deal, but we still have to discover more and then know the details. So what I discovered in my postdoc lab, uh, this is Jennifer, who was is, who is like, Shivaji, do whatever you want, I don't care, uh, as long as you keep me excited. Uh, so uh, basically in Jennifer's lab, I started uh, work on mitochondria, nobody was doing mitochondria work there, and discovered that mitochondria actively control cell cycle by forming the structure which we called, we named as hyperfused mitochondria. Um, and that is formed right before uh, the cells start replicating their DNA, okay? So hyperfused structure of mitochondria is there is maximum fusion. All the mitochondria, rather majority of the mitochondria come together, fuse with each other to act like a single mitochondria. So we called it hyperfused mitochondria. And we showed that uh, that exists in Drosophila from live tissue imaging. We showed that the hyperfused mitochondria structure exists in Drosophila. And if you change hyperfused perfusion levels or by altering the uh, fission fusion protein this is a fission protein and this is a fusion protein you can actually change the cell fate by altering a uh, uh, cell cycle so either the cell will divide more or they will uh, uh, differentiate earlier okay so this was done in flies which I which I learned in Jennifer's lab as well so uh, this part of the work was done in tissue culture and then I picked up flies to actually uh, uh, test more uh, so they not so this is a, a movie where you're appreciating I guess uh, how how dynamic mitochondria are so fission fusion processes of mitochondria are called uh, together mitochondrial dynamism and it turns out this happens only in uh, proliferating cells that I basically learned or rather discovered when Bob Balaban from NIH challenged our, our findings and said this does not whatever you are seeing all this does not happen in differentiated tissue come to my lab and prove me okay so I went to his lab we generally generated a mouse uh, which uh, expressing uh, you know mitochondrial reporter to be able to study this in in vivo with in vivo imaging in differentiated tissue okay uh, here you see this is a result of an in vivo imaging basically if this uh, this highlighted pool of mitochondria uh, get diluted right re if this signal reduces that will be because of active fission fusion and within 30 minutes uh, where, where normally proliferating cells would have reduced this fusion uh, this this uh, signal you do not see a reduction okay that kind that indicated that at least fission fusion if it happens happens in a very slow manner um, in quiescent cells that was in keratinocytes and we, I isolated uh, cells from mouse and, uh, and did some uh, uh, assays uh, in isolated cells where we made them quiescent and saw the same phenomena. It is like this. It's not getting diluted. While they're proliferating, the signal will get diluted because of fission fusion, okay? And this remains unpublished. But then I learned a great deal that, that mitochondrial dynamism is, is attenuated in, in quiescent cells. People understand that now, but this, this piece, like how are they uh, attenuated and what are the changes? changes in the fission-fusion molecules uh, remains to be studied. Not only by us, but, but, but by anybody. Uh, so then I started my own lab to understand more about the hyperfuse mitochondria because, uh, because we saw that it actively regulates cell cycle. So we found in my lab at UAB that hyperfuse mitochondria enriches cell cycle regulators on its surface, okay? Cell cycle regulators that work on the nucleus actually have lifetime on mitochondria surface. And we re realized that if you keep mitochondria hyperfused, so this is a way uh, to genetically keep mitochondria hyperfused, those cell cycle molecules, cyclin E is one of them, uh, will actually uh, uh, go decorate like it is mitochondria. So this is a mitochondria molecule and this is a cell cycle molecule, you can't tell the difference, okay? And and we also realized that recruitment, when, when uh, you know, my cyclin E gets recruited on mitochondria for a purpose, is to 
enhance the ability of the cell to uh, to uh, uh, escape uh, to to make cyclin E levels higher. Okay, so cyclin E gets recruited onto mitochondria, and then it cannot get degraded, and that becomes a recipe for aberrant cell proliferation because there are ways to get rid of cyclin E from mitochondria, and if that happens in quiescent cells, that will start aberrant cell proliferation. Okay, so mitochondria holds on to the cell cycle regulator that is key for cell cycle uh, uh, proliferation and then it builds up it, because the cell cycle regulator cannot get degraded and it, it can be released to, to maintain or induce undue cell proliferation and that's basically cancer. So in collaboration with, with Malay, who's also an alumni, uh, we looked at TCGA and found an uh, example from gene expression analysis uh, that, that this particular molecule, DRP1, the fission molecule, actually co-expresses with cell cycle regulators, not mitochondria regulators, okay? Uh, so we found the DRP1 cell, uh, cell cycle co-expression module in various cancer. Uh, we, we still uh, uh, are interested in genomics and, and trying to you know, tie genomics data with, with uh, cell biology data. Uh, that's uh, a core uh, uh, focus of my field, of, of my lab. Um, and uh, what we also understood that to be able to study uh, mitochondria, hyperfused mitochondria or mitochondria structure function relationship, we had to design our own methods. There weren't enough methods, quantitative en uh, methods in, in the field which we could use to actually tease out between the spectrum of mitochondria structure from all fragmented to all fused, okay? And it's a spectrum. So we designed uh, uh, an assay, a live cell assay, where we would be able to quantify mitochondria mitochondria structure in one axis and function, uh, ATP and uh, redox uh, uh, in, in this particular uh, uh, example, and you will be able to study the relationship in a very quantitative way, okay? And uh, we, with that, we discovered that fission-fusion uh, actually, which is supposed to counter each other, that's why they're inversely proportional. They are only inversely proportional only till a certain level of fusion. And be below that, actually, the relationship, the inverse relationship breaks, okay? So only with quantitation, we could, uh, we could uh, identify, or rather, we could understand the detailed relationship of fission-fusion. And here it shows that mitochondria uh, in various different cells uh, have our method to study structure function relationship, if possible, on various different cell types, not only in proliferating cells. But in proliferating cell, we started, when we started working on cancer, we realized that we could, there is a particular subset of stem cells which have almost tenfold higher ability of self-renewal, and that could be isolated by a mitochondrial functional parameter, okay? We, when when we applied our method of structure analysis of, of this pool of stem cells, which we call mitochondria prime stem cells, we, and we realized that they actually have very distinct mitochondria shape. Okay, and if you alter uh, mitochondrial fission uh, molecules to to uh, get to that shape, then you can enrich the stem cells or even the stem cell division, even in Drosophila. Okay. So, and later, a recent study, most recent study is where we could, um, we could actually get to the fine-tuned level of the fission molecule that will maintain the mitochondria prime stem cells, okay? It's not absolute uh, reduction or it's not absolute uh, 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 like overactivity, okay? So again, uh, quantitation led us to identify uh, uh, this fine-tuned repression of the mitochondrial fission protein that will prime the, the stem cells to be more carcinogenic and we could do that by uh, you know our uh, uh, a single cell assay on the microscopy and we could uh, do that by expressing we could actually get to the levels by expressing mutants or using shRNA and this is just to show you uh, that this these are the mitochondria prime cells from our uh, single cell uh, structure analysis which are uh, uh, which which can be enriched by using very small dose of carcinogen so what the the theme that i'm bringing up here is nuance when we are thinking about mitochondria nuance is a key word because they are energy producers and they are also sensors of our 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 body okay of of each cell rather so if their function is not nuanced basically we are not uh, they won't be able to help us do the right thing at the right time right so understand when we are thinking about mitochondria we should always go for very nuanced analysis uh, there uh, uh, this is an example where we quantified to show that when the fusion level goes beyond this point these are the cells actually the stemness uh, stemness is inhibited 
only when the fusion levels are at this range, stemness is promoted. When it goes to this range, it, it is actually inhibited. So again, nuance. Uh, this is just basically a, 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 a schematic depiction of what we found. Uh, so this is the Goldilocks zone of mitochondrial fission protein that will maintain uh, cells with only 40% hyperfusion. That's what we learned from quantization. Okay, beyond 40%, you will actually and like move gradually move towards this region, which actually inhibits the mitochondria prime stem cells. But this 40% level of hyperfusion is the is the way to support uh, uh, stemness. Uh, this is an example of where we want to use the, the methods that we develop in, in our translational projects where we want to identify the mitochondria prime stem cells and use uh, inhibitors to actually eliminate them so that we can prevent cancer recurrence. Uh, this is uh, uh, my, my current lab. Uh, of course, yeah, it's, a, it's an evolving situation. Uh, Shukuma is not there, somebody else has joined, and other students have joined, but this is when we were setting up the lab. Uh, these are a whole a host of collaborators. My collaborators have been very, very helpful, and I cannot function with them because I'm always walking out of my comfort zone to, to, to uh, study things because I'm always trying to follow the white rabbit, okay? Um, so question has been always important for me. So we are interested in, in marrying uh, single cell microscopy with single cell uh, RNA-seq uh, data, if we can. And the reason I joined uh, Ashoka uh, of, of various places in India is to be able to do more quantitative biology in, in my field so that we can do uh, these kind of uh, uh, integrated studies. And the model systems that we use in the lab are uh, Drosophila cells and, and patient samples. So this is just to pay it forward from what I learned in CCMB, how to follow the white rabbit. So for, for young people, please follow the white rabbit because that's where the excitement lies. Uh, Alice found the wonderland. Neo found the matrix following the white rabbit. It may be difficult, but if you get there, it, it's really, really exciting. Uh, this, is a, this is a poem that I wrote, I'll read out. Uh, it's on my website uh, to encourage uh, original thinking and, uh, and you know, be a part of our philosophy uh, of doing science in the lab. Original thinking is worth the pain. The devil is in the details, my friend. Small but thorough, putting all of it together, healthy competition just makes it better. Three cheers for scientific rigor and ethic, equality and fairness on this simply basic. Science and art deliver creativity, wonders galore, let's grab the opportunity. So we want to be able to follow the rabbit uh, always uh, in my lab and anybody who joins my lab, uh, that's the encouragement. Thank you very much for your attention. If there are questions, I'll be back. Thank you, Dr. Kasturi. That was a thought-provoking talk. Uh, we are ready to take questions. Uh, you can raise hands and Mike will reach you. A hey, wonderful talk, Kasuri. So uh, the question that I have is actually about your science. I mean, if I'm allowed to ask Absolutely. details of that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you, you essentially mentioned that cyclins, which are kind of, if I'm not wrong, sequestered, sequestered to the mitochondrial surface and then slowly release for the function they're supposed to do. But do you think they, 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 they perform something else? They alter the uh, en energy... Uh, metabolism or something related to that, particularly in cancer cells? Yeah, so um, uh, I'll just refine your question a little bit. Um, uh, they, so it's uh, one of the, not all the cyclins may do that, but we've looked at a couple and cyclin E seems to be doing that uh, the, the most efficient way. Uh, so it's not slowly released. Uh, it is uh, really, it releases very fast and the, the, the trigger comes from change in mitochondrial structure or function or even uh, molecules like RAS. Uh, you know, if you induce RAS, uh, that, uh, that makes um, uh, cyclin E uh, release from mitochondrial surface and when I say surface, I mean it does not go inside mitochondria. Uh, so it's, that's why it's very easy to control. It's very, uh, it, the release is very easy to control. If it goes inside mitochondria, it may be doing things. But from the, what the, we had the same question and we started looking into cyclin E knockouts, cyclin E1 and E2 knockouts, if mitochondria are different. So the answer is yes. Mitochondrial, uh, the potential, the primed, uh, 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 property that I was telling you, that actually uh, is decided by mitochondrial potential. How much, what is the mitochondrial potential uh, uh, that would prime uh, the stem cells 
There we found changes in mitochondrial shape is, is, is different. There we found changes in mitochondrial potential. But I'm not sure if that is due to cyclin E going in or because of some nuclear change that can impact. Any transcription factor can impact mitochondrial property. Okay. But we've not found cyclin E. Uh, even a stem cell, uh, uh, another stem cell lab has shown uh, uh, it on mitochondria in stem cells. So re really, in a way, better than we did. Uh, and they did not find it uh, inside as well. Okay, so is it, um, do you find them in under normal physiological conditions or under some pathological conditions as uh, well? Cyclin E on mitochondria? Right. Cyclin, so if you isolate mitochondria, any cell type that we've, uh, uh, that we've studied, even uh, uh, Drosophila, you will always find some pool of cyclin E on mitochondria, okay? That changes, uh, our, 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 our data will show that if mitochondria are all fragmented, cyclin E will be released from mitochondria. Or if mitochondria are not able to maintain their energetics, cyclin E will be released from mitochondria. So pathological situation which would impact that, I would believe that uh, you would not find anything on mitochondria. The reason we have, I think the reason others have not found or we also struggled, we were not able to reproduce our own data is because of the transient nature of cyclin E. And if you isolate mitochondria where mitochondria do not remain healthy by biochemical uh, 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 preps, then cyclin E will be released from mitochondria. For, while doing immunofluorescence, if we do a PBS wash that does not have, uh, have uh, you know, glucose or other carbon sources to maintain mitochondria energetics, that is going to release uh, cyclin E from mitochondria. So it's actively maintained on mitochondria by energetics, and we think cyclin E Read, uh, rather mitochondrial redox is the key because we are we have found which is not published we are that's an active project going on in the lab the cyclin e is likely a redox active protein so it has 10 cysteines we are we have uh, uh, altered one cysteine thus far and found that the redox regulation is highly abrogated and we are now trying to you know mutate all the 10 in combinations all the other nine in combinations and that that paper possibly will will send out in, in some time yeah yeah, in the Hi, uh, this is just a curious question. You talked about the mitochondrial status in uh, quiescent cells and then actually proliferating cancer cells. What about the other spectrum of quiescence, like in post mitotic cells? So do you, uh, cells like neurons, post mitotic cells, which is also a quiescent cell, yeah. but it's another spectrum, yes. right? So, so, do you so are you talking about cyclin E on mitochondria in this aspect? Uh, or, or mitochondrial behavior in the yes, post mitotic Yes, yes. So as I told you that uh, mitochondria, uh, mitochondrial dynamics dynamics is very much attenuated in, in post-mitotic cells that could be either in G0 or real tissue which are quiescent, right? Uh, which we have done by in vivo imaging. Uh, and uh, if we are looking at cyclin E on mitochondria in post-mitotic uh, tissue, uh, maybe I can go back to the data here. If, oh no, maybe I removed it. Um, Oh no no no! It's it's there. So um, this is a this is a Drosophila tissue. Uh, this is basically quantifying cyclin E on mitochondria from mitotic cells from this tissue. And so basically, red is cyclin E uh, and uh, green is mitochondria. And these are mitotic. And this is these two are post mitotic cells in the same tissue. One area is is MBC. The other area is PFC. And they are differentiated into these types by EGFR signaling, okay? And we found that MBCs, which are devoid of EGFR signaling, they have the maximum ab abundance of cyclin E on mitochondria. And that is because in that tissue, the mitochondria maintain as hyperfused as I showed you here. Um, yeah. So basically, these are MBCs, and mitochondria, this mitochondria cluster is completely hyperfused. This assay shows that, okay? So these cells maintain the maximum uh, level of cyclin E on mitochondria. Although both are differentiated, right? PFCs, this is PFC. Both are differentiated. They, just because DRP1 is repressed and they maintain hyperfused mitochondria, cyclin E is more. Now, our question was, our question still is, if you induce tumor genesis, so if you express RAS in, in these cells, right, would that be more uh, debilitating 
uh, active RAS I'm talking about, will, will that be more debilitating in, in turning these cells into cancerous cells, right? Because they have maximum abundance of cyclineon mitochondria. Uh, and, and rather, these cells have very little, right? And this situation can exist in our body, right? We can have cells which have hyperfused mitochondria, or there could be situations, there could be stress-related situations, which will create hyperfusion of mitochondria, and then that will uh, let cycline, uh, you know, uh, 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 be recruited to mitochondria and held back there. And then now there is another level of stress. We all possibly know that cancer is, is a multi-step process, right? One stress maybe causes hyperfusion. Stress has been shown to cause hyperfusion, which recruits cycline on mitochondria. Another stress causes a mutation. Now if that's a RAS mutation is going to release cycline from mitochondria. And then that may be a recipe for cancer. We still haven't proved that, proven that yet, but then there's a small project in the lab, should not say small project, there is a project in the lab to, to actually test some little uh, bit of, of this, what I just said. Yeah. Differentiated tissues are all different. Uh, and and that's, that's why, I mean, it, nuance is, is the key in, in trying to study them, study mitochondrial role in them. Excuse me. Here. Yeah. Uh, so my question is uh, about uh, whether there are any genetic mutations known where the fused uh, mitochondria are not able to hold the cycline. I mean, I know it's pro probably a very new thing that you're working on, but I'm just thinking out loud if we, anything like that is known. We think that we will get that answer or answer in that direction from our genomic studies that we are currently doing. Uh, yeah, so we are basically, we are interested in doing uh, uh, genomics from cancer patients uh, and uh, identify, uh, you know, mutations and then isolate those cells uh, from tumor, uh, from the patients that we are sequencing and then look at various mitochondrial function. We, would, we want to apply our uh, uh, mitosin square or mitosin squares for single cells, same squares for single mitochondria uh, alongside and, and also look at mitochondria priming, right, stem cell priming from, from cells isolated from the tissue where parallel genomics would be done. So we think or we hope that some of it will be revealed from there. Uh, and if I may, I, I have like a non-science experience based question. Like you've moved from a university uh, in the West to a university in India. How has that experience been? Uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I moved back for uh, for both professional and personal reasons. Uh, but the professional reason was I was kind of stifled in, um, in a med school setup where I was uh, in, in, b because their uh, cross-talking with physicists, uh, mathematicians, computer scientists was, was almost, uh, almost impossible, right? Uh, but med school had their own way of doing things. And, and I think I was in a second tier med school, not in, in Harvard or any, anywhere, where this is, this is very different. Uh, but in a second tier med school in US, it's, it's very, very translation oriented. Uh, and this crosstalk with fundamental scientists is very minimal. The reason I moved to Ashoka is to be able to do this. So now my, so we are working on a paper which got started in the US in my lab, but we are finishing up with the help of uh, uh, mathematics. So in the team, there is of course my lab members. There is a, a student from a computer science who has, uh, who has actually uh, refined a code that we've already used before. Um, and uh, a st like student from my lab is using that code to generate data, which will be now looked at by a, uh, by a team from a math, math department to be able to, you know, get we, thus far in our own limited uh, mathematics understanding, we have been able to look at structure function relationship only in a linear manner. We want to discover if there are non-linear relationships and then there are, it's very obvious. So we want to collaborate with mathematicians. Uh, so at Ashoka, this is very seamless. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you. Before you leave, ma'am, we'd like to present you with the memento. Uh, I'll request Dr. Manjula Reddy to uh, come onto the stage and uh, felicitate Dr. Kasturi. Thank you, Dr. Kasturi. Thank you, Dr. Manjula.